My name is Erin Wu. I'm a product designer here at Figma, where I work on collaboration and file organization tools. And it is totally blowing my mind how many people are here in person with me today. Wow, yeah. Let's hear it. Um, uh, it's also particularly exciting for me because it's my first config where I got to work on something that's launched. So hopefully the next time you open your file browser, you'll notice it's a little bit easier and a little bit more delightful to find the files you need. Uh, so feel free to find me around the venue later if you've got any questions about it. And speaking of all the amazing features we announced, how about this morning's keynote? I, I imagine we're all still buzzing about the exciting features that we announced, such as, I don't know, variables? Like, holy cow, we have design tokens, finally. I'm sure every design systems person here just like shed a single tear of joy when they saw the news drop. Or can we hear it for auto layout? Yeah. To this day, it still feels like magic every single time I use it. Um, and how about dev mode? Raise your hands if you're really excited about dev mode. Awesome, I am too. Um, and if you're here in person and need your help finding your way around, just look for a friendly face in a blue Figma tee, or config tee. Uh, we've literally flown hundreds of Figmates around the world, around the country, um, just to be here and make this an exceptional experience for you. And if you're joining us on virtual, Figmates are here in the chat. Just say hello and reach out if you need anything. Uh, and lastly, if you're going to document your way around the venue, use the hashtag config2023 and share it to your favorite socials, whether it's Twitter, Mastodon, Instagram, et cetera, whatever your choice. All right, I have done enough talking. Let's get started with the first talk of the day. Um, at today's keynote, you saw some really exciting advanced prototyping features, and we've actually got the team here to share their journey and what they see lying ahead with prototyping. So please put your hands together and welcome Nico to the stage. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, and thanks so much and welcome uh, for you all to coming in. This room looked significantly smaller without people in it. Um, so yeah, if I'm a little bit nervous, uh, excuse me. But yeah, we, John, Garrett, Chia, and I will tell you a little bit about why and how we built the prototyping features that launched today. And so we've been looking forward to this day for a while, so we really hope you enjoy it. And also, welcome to everyone joining in on the live stream. So quick show of hands, as best as I can see it. Who here has done pottery before? Oh, it's actually quite a few. Personally, pottery is one of my favorite um, offsite activities as well. I would love to do it more often. But in an offsite, it's just fun to kind of like get your hands dirty with your teammates. You build something, it falls down, you try to build it again. And um, it's, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun. But yeah, why are we talking about this? In this amazing book, Sketching User Experiences, Bill Buxton, a user researcher at Microsoft, um, tells a story he read about a ceramics class. The teacher comes in at the first day of the semester and splits the group in half. And basically says, OK, you're going to be graded in two different ways. The first half would not have to do much to get the best grade. They would just have to deliver one perfect pot. right? But the second group would be evaluated by the weight of all pots. And so they would have to deliver 50 pounds of working pots, and they would, yeah, get the best grade for that. So the question is, who do you think delivered the better pots consistently? And the first group essentially started theorizing. What does perfect even mean? How would you evaluate that? How did, like, what could it look like? What happens if there's different people with different tastes? Right? And ultimately, though, this cost them precious time. And the things that they had to show at the end was a lot of theories, a lot of what, what does perfect mean, and one version of what perfect could be. Right? But the other group, the second class, would consistently deliver not just more, but better results as well. Because even if you don't need to learn, literally just by creating a bunch of ideas over and over again, you'll learn as you go. It's basically unavoidable. And so while the takeaway from the story is often described as quantity leads to quality, I don't think that's necessarily true, because just quantity alone doesn't, doesn't improve things, right? Instead of this, I think it makes much more sense, similar as, as described in the book, to describe it as iteration leads to quality. Because iteration includes learning from your past approaches it in, while you're exploring the next one. Each iteration allowed the students to learn what worked and what didn't. And if they wanted to or not, when they tried again, they were already better than before. 
And this is very different than theorizing or statically sketching out your idea on a piece of paper hundreds of times, because they will always lack the right dimensions necessary to evaluate the quality of them. Like, just think about the group creating a real pot. Once you have the pot, you can put it on, on the table. You can evaluate it next to other objects. You can see the size. You can feel the weight. You can see how the light hits it, how it reflects, how it casts a shadow. Those are all things that are really hard to see and evaluate when you are just sketching out. But more importantly, let's say you have two pots, right? And suddenly you can see, oh, I like, I like this one, this part more than here. Or like, oh, maybe I should change something here. The moment you do the third one, you've learned from both of them before in comparison. And even more, think about the workspace that those people are creating their pots in. I've been talking so much about pots, but think about it. It's a workspace where a lot of pots are standing around you. You're continuously creating more and more pots. And as other students come in, maybe take a break, they're like, ooh, I, I like this one. I like this one over here. Ah, this one you could probably work on a little bit. And so by seeing all of those iterations laid out, you invite fruitful conversations with others, with your coworkers, and this leads to even more and better ideas. And so, yeah, iteration does lead to quality. And this is not just true for pottery. We believe this is equally true for designing software, right? Because there are so many aspects, so many dimensions of experience to get software just right. It's not just the visual aspect, but also how it feels, how information flows, how it's changed by the user. And of course, you never really know if it works until you give it into the hand of someone who hasn't seen this before and they need to try to like fucking figure it out. So yeah, static sketches simply don't do that. They can't provide a full interactive experience, which they lack the dimensionality necessary for you and others to evaluate them properly. And this brings us to our topic today, prototyping, making things interactive. And today, we're going to talk about the past, the present, and the future of prototyping. And we hope that this talk gives you some insights into how we work and think when we're building tools for you, and contextualizes what you've seen in Dylan's keynote earlier today in this massive room down there. And so, yeah, first, let's take a look at the past. And for this, I'd love you all to welcome Garrett, our PM on prototyping and amazing thought partner. Garrett, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Nico, for the very warm welcome. I am so excited to be here with you all. We've been waiting a very long time for the day. It felt like holding the hose shut just so we could get to today. So it's a very big day for us and hopefully for you too. Um, I'm going to talk about the past, and I promise this won't be a history lesson, but I do want to go back in time a bit and talk about a, um, an, a concept that's existed in creative tools for quite some time now. An endless canvas. Uh, it's a common surface in our tools, uh, and it lets you freely pan around, explore, and create alternate versions easily. And this is crucial for a tool that aims to support people in their creative process, because to try out a new idea, all you need to do is duplicate it. You make some changes, and it's so much easier than trying to create an entirely new pot. Just copy, paste, boom, you've got another. And oftentimes, after you do one, you have another and another until you get to the point where the design file might start to look something like this. <laughs> Tons of iterations and a little bit of a mess. And I'm sure people here have made files that look far, far worse than this one. Um, and we don't actually think that this messiness is a problem. We think that it's a feature. Because if you think about the ceramics class that Nico was talking about, being able to see things side by side, being able to share these with other people, it's actually key to finding the best ideas together as a team. And so while nearly everyone does this for iterating on visual ideas, we don't really do it with interactive ones. Today, we're going to talk about why we think that is and why we think that we can actually change that. And so for this, we actually want to take a look at the role of prototyping in the design process. How do we see it? Where is it positioned? We also want to talk about the responsibility of our tools in this process. How do our tools impact the way that we think and the way that we create? So let's start with this first one. The design process starts pretty simple. You open up Figma with an idea. You land on a blank screen, you start exploring, you make shapes, you arrange them, you duplicate them, you make a mess, you clean it up, you make it messy again, and then you clean it one more time so you can share it with a friend or a coworker. And you spend a ton of time at this part. 
but it's only later, only sometimes, that you might decide it's actually time to add some interactivity. And this often happens at the end of the process when you're so deep into it, because you need to share it with someone else, but in order for them to understand it, it needs to behave as realistically as possible. So you do these interactions so that they can understand your idea and fully grasp it. And then you get feedback, you test it yourself, you, you see some things that aren't quite working, and it, it becomes difficult to actually turn back. Because at this point, you've built all of this interactive scaffolding around your visual designs that tearing it all down just to change a few things feels like scaling a whole new mountain. And this sucks, because as Nico said, iteration leads to quality and revisions are expensive. So how did we arrive here with this process? We think that our tools are actually a big reason why. We've created a space where prototyping is an optional step at the end of the design process. And it gets us to our second point, the responsibility of our tools. This is a, famous, a fairly famous quote, we shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. And I agree with this. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, so why change something that works? And this gives us toolmakers a lot of power, and there's another fairly famous quote, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so what has Figma done with that power over the years to help you create these interactive experiences? We've had prototyping since day one. Our first release was in 2017, letting you connect one frame to the next. And along with some smaller features, we took a few bigger steps. Four years ago, we shipped, uh, we shipped Smart Animate, which is an effective way of bringing more life into your designs. And then, in October of 2021, we launched Interactive Components, the ability to contain interactive state in a single object. But then last year, we were asked, is there more that we could be doing? And prototyping is a vast product area. Where do you even start with that kind of question? And there's tons of ideas. But we did 30 hours of in-depth user research sessions with all sorts of people. People have never prototyped before, prototypers from small teams, uh, a lot from much larger organizations. And as a lot of you can probably relate, if you ask 30 people their opinions about what's most important, you'll get 30 different, very unique answers. <laughs> and we heard a lot. More animation control, richer inputs, camera access, gyroscope, all sorts of features for all sorts of needs. And these are things that we want to build. But when we were actually thinking about what, what is the core problem here, what's staring us in the face for years, it was this. Pasta pictures. You may have heard a few, uh, few pasta puns at the, uh, at the keynote. And we actually uh, we kind of embraced this at Figma over the last few years. Uh, four years ago, Nico created this channel in Slack called Pasta Pictures. And he is not super into spaghetti, although I do think he enjoys it. Um, we call the prototype connections that you make in Figma noodles. And this channel was a place to kind of share these photos that we see posted a lot in time. It's like blue, explosive screenshots. And it is not a pretty channel. It's a lot of pictures like this. <laughs> and this is wild, right? <laughs> and before diving into what's really wrong here, because there is, there is a lot, I should note that people are still really proud when they're posting these things, because it's showing this time and effort they spent building something that's truly incredible. But it's really painful for us to look at. Because we knew, <laughs> so we knew we had to fix this, because if it's not super obvious already, there's just too many frames. Users are dealing with hundreds of nearly identical frames and thousands of connections. And this is bad on so many levels. It's really, really hard to create these things. It takes hours and hours to arrive at that point. And after you create something, as Nico was saying, you want to go and change one small thing, but it sucks because it's also really, really hard to extend. Everything is duplicated. These frames are everywhere. And you're so late in the prototyping process that you can't actually go back and change that one small detail. Or you come back from a long vacation, you open up this file in Figma, and then you're just staring at it. <laughs> You have completely forgotten what you are doing here, because it's way too much to keep in your head. No human could actually do that. And that gets us to our last problem. If you can't un understand it, good luck actually trying to get someone else to understand this. If they can't jump in, they can't come in and help riff with you, they can't make copies, because it's just too much to internalize. So why do all these problems matter? Because together, they make it way, way too hard to iterate. I said before that revisions are costly, and this is a perfect example of how severe that cost can actually be. So it's no wonder that prototyping is usually a later optional step in the design process. We've created an environment where it doesn't let you iterate freely on your, in the design process. And it doesn't need to stay that way. We think that with the right tools, with the right environment, we can actually have a much simpler process. 
one in which designing and prototyping, exploring these visual and interactive ideas is actually intertwined and intermingled. So imagine iterating on your interactions as easily as you create shapes and arrange objects. And both dimensions can be worked on together instead of in succession. You'd be much more likely to find your actual best idea. So we wanted to create a truly dynamic space for everyone here to prototype. And that's what we've been working on for the last year. So that brings us from the past to now, today. This morning, we shipped an entirely new foundation for prototyping in Figma. We built advanced prototyping, which gives you more power with fewer frames. And we made a bunch of usability improvements, things that will allow you to work even faster. And we hope that together, that these features can shape our behaviors and open up new opportunities for creation. So with this journey from the past to now complete, we're going to dig into advanced prototyping. We'll hear from John, one of our engineers who worked hard to help make these features a reality for you all. John, can you tell us what you built? Thanks, Garrett. I'm John, and I'm excited to talk to you about some of the work we did here. Let's start with a brief overview on what advanced prototyping means. It's simple, and it consists of three things. Variables, which we developed in conjunction with the design systems team. Expressions, as a means of changing those variables. And multiple actions and conditionals, to allow for complex behaviors and branches and logic in your prototypes. Let's take a look at an example prototype built before these new features. In this shopping cart app, you can see a list of products, add them to your basket, view their details page, and go to a checkout screen. It's nothing too fancy, but if you look at how it was built in Figma, this is what it looks like. Look at all of those noodles making up another classic pasta picture. Now, I want you to imagine trying to add an icon to this prototype. Think about how many frames you'd have to change. It doesn't sound very easy, iterative, or fun. Now let's look at a similar prototype built with our new features. You can still do everything the previous prototype did. You can scroll through, you can look at products, view their details page, and add them to your basket. But now, when you add an item to the basket, you'll notice the cart icon gets updated with the number of products in your basket. And then we calculate the price for you, and when you reach over $100, we even apply a discount. So in other words, this prototype packs in more functionality than the last one, so you'd for sure expect more frames. But ultimately, all of the logic for this prototype is contained in just this small set of frames. This makes prototyping so much faster and so much easier to understand. To really show you the impact, let's zoom out and compare these two setups side by side. <laughs> and remember, the one on the right packs in more capabilities. All of this made possible with just these three features. I'll share more details about how we built these features, particularly expressions. But before we do that, let's dissect the problem with that old prototype by looking at how prototypes worked before today. So say I wanted to build that same shopping cart app. I'll start with a counter. And when the user clicks the plus button, I want to increment the count. And when they click minus, I want to decrement the count. So of course, I would need to make a second frame that has a number two and a noodle going from the plus button to the two. And let's not forget the noodle going backwards in case they click minus. And what if I want three frames, or four, five, six, 10 frames? And now what if I want to extend this prototype to add a clear basket button that takes you all the way to zero? I would have to add this button to every single frame along with a corresponding noodle. You can already see how this is getting chaotic. And after doing all this, what are we left with? A shopping cart app that goes up to 10 that we can't easily add functionality to. But what if there is a better way? What if we didn't need to enumerate every single possible frame? Let's think about what we would have to do to build that same prototype. First, we would need to store the number of items in your cart, show you that number on your prototype, and then enable you to change that number when you press certain buttons. Let's talk about storage first. At Figma, we want to keep things as simple as possible. So when we realized that the design systems team wanted to build design tokens and we needed variables, we decided to join forces to collaborate and support both features. So for prototypes, you can create variables to store all the data you need in the same modal that you'll use to create your design tokens. We have four types of variables to store all the data you may need. Numbers, strings, booleans, which just means true, false, and colors. OK. We solved the problem of storage. You can create a number variable that represents the number of items in your cart. Now, how do we make it show up on the prototype? Well, we solved this problem with something we call bindings. Throughout the Properties panel, you'll now see this new icon next to some fields, such as height, width, text content. These fields can be bound to variables, so that their value corresponds to the value stored by the variable. For this prototype, we want to bind our field to the text content. One amazing side effect of this feature is that when the variable is updated, you'll see that change reflected in all frames that have a field bound to that variable. 
OK, now we can store a variable and use that variable's value. So it was time to work on enabling you to change that variable. In this example, when you click the plus button, we just want to add one to the count. This is what we call an expression. You can broadly think of them as equations, or more simply, that you want to express what you want Figma to do with your variable. For numbers, we need to do things like add, subtract, divide, and multiply. For a string variable, maybe you would want to append strings to make a custom welcome message, like, hello, John. And perhaps you only need a button to show up if some count is larger than five. This can be done with a Boolean expression that evaluates the true or false. So we started thinking, how could we enable users to manipulate data in all the ways they may need? How could we allow you to easily write expressions for all three of these variable types to give you the control to do whatever you may want to do to make the wackiest prototypes that we can't even begin to imagine? We needed to create an expression builder. And in order to do that, we first needed to build something that works and then make it feel smooth and usable. In order to evaluate expressions, we had to build an engine to compute them. Take, for example, a calculation like this. How would the computer know what to do first? Fortunately for us, most programming languages had to solve the same problem a long time ago, so we just did the same thing they do, which is called an abstract syntax tree. It's just a way of storing expressions that maintains the order of operations, and then you can compute the result by traversing the tree. In this case, the calculation would yield 42. There's a lot of complexity that went into building this, but we don't want you to have to worry about any of this, so you're never going to see an abstract syntax tree while you're making expressions in Figma. I want to take this moment to give a huge shout out to our engineer who built this out late last year, Willie. Uh, Willie even packed in some amazing features here that we haven't been able to show you yet. So thank you for the incredible work, Willie. Yeah. Now, the engine might sound pretty abstract, but we needed a tangible UI to write expressions and test them in your prototypes quickly. So finally, introducing the expression builder or at least the humble beginning of what became the expression builder we're releasing today. This right here is just a text box, and this is what we started with. Did it work? Kind of, if you knew like, exactly how to use it. Could we have shipped this? No way. A simple text box just didn't meet our quality standards. There were way more features we wanted to pack in here. So you might be wondering, how many features could we possibly need? And I was asking that same question when I joined this project. And it turns out there's a lot. We needed to enable you to search for variables, select them, evaluate your expression, handle errors, copy paste, undo redo, various keyboard flows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this isn't even an exhaustive list. So with that list of features in mind, we started working on making the experience feel right. And this is, of course, a story about iteration. And it's also a story about how important it is for designers and developers to work together to make the best user experience. In the next few slides, you'll see some test videos from early iterations of the expression builder. They're really blurry. You'll have to forgive the low image quality. At the time I took these videos, I had no idea they would end up in a presentation on a big screen. But prototyping is all about making a mess. So we're pulling back the curtain and giving you a peek into our actual development process. With that being said, let me take you on our journey. I started by working on a proof of concept. Here's a video from early stage development where I hooked up my component to a variable picker made by the design systems team. When a variable was picked, I would render it and place a new text input after it so you could keep typing. I wrote some logic to manage the cursor position and selection state, and voila, we had a working demo. This was a great starting point, as it enabled us to start an early beta and begin acquiring valuable user feedback. But it wouldn't work for a permanent solution. You couldn't select all across the text input, you couldn't copy-paste variables after you've chosen them, and you couldn't undo and redo using your keyboard shortcuts. The cursor tracking logic was really complex, and the solution just wouldn't scale to fit all of our requirements. So while this iteration worked, and it let you make fun prototypes like the one you see here, we knew these interaction details would matter a lot to our users. We needed to get this right, and so we needed a different technical approach to support this. So I tried to build it from scratch. There's a flag you can apply to a container called content editable that allows you to render UI and type text in the same area. This would solve the problem of selecting all across the text input if it weren't so difficult to work with. Here's a video of the state after about a whole week of me spinning my wheels with it. It doesn't look so great. It turned out that with the freedom to do anything, I also had the burden of managing everything, and there was a lot to manage here. I kept running into issues, and I realized I'm not the only one having these problems. Fortunately for me, there are teams out there that work on solutions to things like this, which brought me to Lexical. I want to give a huge shout out to the team at Meta that works on this framework. Lexical essentially gives you a content editable, but with APIs that make it easier to use. So I could now write custom logic to create variable nodes and serialization logic to handle copy-pasting them. I could easily define nodes and manage my cursor's position. 
I could even use their out-of-the-box plugin to enable undo and redo behaviors. So I got to work refactoring to use Lexical while feedback from our beta users started rolling in. And this is live footage, of course. <laughs> and it wasn't long until I had reached parity with our original version, plus some of those bonus features I've been talking about, like select all, copy-pasting variables, and undo redo, all of which you can see here. This was the first time I got it all working. So after iterating on our approach and landing on one that would enable us to meet our high quality bar, we got to work on actually making the experience feel smooth. We wanted the expression builder to be fast, discoverable, intuitive, and consistent. We know that the fastest way to build an expression is to type it. So we wanted to make sure that as you're typing, your search results are highlighted and you can always just press enter to select your variables. Discoverable. We know that an empty text box can be daunting if you don't yet know what to do. So we wanted to make sure that you have helpful suggestions all the way through and you can click through your expressions if you prefer to use your mouse. Intuitive. Users shouldn't have to learn a new way to compose an expression with novel interactions. Especially because we display this like a simple text field, we really wanted it to feel like one. So that meant that all common interactions like select all, copy paste, and undo redo really needed to work smoothly. This might sound like the simplest one, but you'll recall it's the bulk of why my initial approach didn't work and why we had to iterate. Now, it just feels right. And lastly, as you might see, we use a similar UI whether you're searching for a variable to be set, setting a binding in the properties panel, or building an expression. We want you to learn once and use twice, so we needed to make sure these interactions are consistent wherever they're used. With these principles baked into the expression builder, changing a variable became something intuitive, simple, and fun. But wait, there's more. With the expression builder, we unlocked another key feature. So far, I've only talked about expressions as a means of setting a variable. But what if you wanted to conditionally enable certain behaviors? You'll remember in the previous demo, we apply a discount when you reach over $100 in your cart's value. To do this, you add a conditional action, which is just an expression that evaluates to true or false. So in this case, if the total is greater than 100, that's our condition. If that's true, we want to show the discount. And if it's false, we want to hide the discount. When you're making a conditional, you're not manipulating a variable in the condition, but you can use variables to write a Boolean expression that evaluates to true or false. All of these features together now allow you to explore more interactive ideas with far fewer frames. For example, you can create a little onboarding flow that only allows you to continue once you have at least five items selected. You can see the number going down as the user clicks their plants until finally the button becomes clickable. The frames for this prototype are shown on the right. That's all it took to make this. You could also create a little quiz that you can use to check your coworkers' knowledge of plants. Again, look how clean the frames on the right look. That's all it took. And with our new tools, you can even build a fully functioning calculator. Again, with just a few frames. To learn how to build amazing prototypes like this, I invite you all to check out our deep dive session tomorrow. Now, before I hand it over, there's one more example I want to share. One of our colleagues, Fifi, had a little downtime and built this mochi pounding game for fun. I thought it was cool, so I copied it over and I fiddled with it a little bit. I changed the animation speed, I changed the number of clicks you need to complete it, and I even added a score counter so you can compete with your friends. You might think this doesn't matter because it's not a serious prototype that we're actually going to build into a feature. But I believe we create our best work in spaces where we have fun creating. And I sincerely hope these new tools we're releasing will enable you to have more fun creating as well. Now, reducing the number of frames was a huge win. But with fewer frames, we realized we had other problems as well. So next up, we have Chia, a designer on our team, to talk to you about usability. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm Chia. Let's continue talking about the present by taking a look again at this larger process. So it's no secret by now. We believe that the magic of design happens when we iterate, when our tools let us explore our half-baked thoughts and our ideas, translating them into forms and artifacts that we can feel out, test, and even play with. So we wanted to take a closer look at what we actually mean when we say that we want you to iterate as we move towards an iteration process that supports both visual and interactive ideas. We have to care about the hundreds and hundreds of small steps and actions that iteration is actually made up of. So John has talked you through how we vastly lessened the amount of frames necessary to prototype, thus reducing the amount of steps needed to express your interactive ideas. But that's not enough. We also wanted to improve how it actually feels to take each of these steps. As to us, iteration is fiddling. 
it isn't just jumping from one big idea to the next big idea. Iteration is that state where we're just experimenting, when we're trying out as many things as we can to see which one sticks. It's when we're constantly editing, testing, feeling, going back to the drawing board. It happens in the details, in the repetition, in the labor that goes into the design process. It's in the making that matches our pace of thought. It's in the state that we learn the most we can, and thus, we design better. So your workspace should be built for constant iteration, not just for cooking pasta. But it was too difficult to iterate with prototyping. We know this. Aside from taking too many steps, it was slow, tedious. It was just too costly to revise everything. Because our ideal workspace must let us prototype as fast as we design in order to let us prototype as we design. So it's not just the amount of steps necessary, especially if these steps don't really feel smooth to take. Ultimately, it's the time everything takes. So this is what our usability work was concerned with, improving the speed across all parts of your prototyping process, whether you're previewing your first interaction or, or tweaking it for the hundredth time. So I'm going to share a couple of ways that we've been working towards this state of constant iteration beginning with two areas that we wanted to tackle. So first, in speeding up editing flows. Let me begin with a thought. Say, I go into the office regularly, and I have decided that I want to make a better habit out of drinking eight glasses of water a day, the bare minimum hydration needs. <laughs> so at Figma, we have a flexible desk plan. And I know myself, I am lazy. And if I book the desk most distant from the drinking fountain, I will not get up throughout the day to get those eight glasses in. So a water bottle might help, right? I could carry more than a glass worth each time. But I still have to walk over every few hours. Maybe if you were in the same position as I was, you'd still work it out. Maybe you have a much larger water bottle. But at the same time, why am I making myself travel this much to accomplish what I need? It's just not optimal. I'm pretty much setting myself up for failure by booking that distant desk in this comically large space. So back to the actual product. A similar thing was happening in our workspace when editing interactions from the canvas, you had to travel all the way back to the sidebar. So this might feel a lot less distant than a walk through the floor for water, but consider how many times you actually take this step when you're building your prototypes. So back to the office. It's a simple solution, right? If I book myself the desk closer to the water fountain, perhaps even the one right next to it, I don't really have any excuse. So the goal I set becomes more natural, and it becomes embedded into my daily routine, a breeze to repeat for all my hydration needs. So back to the workspace. And in that context, again, when you're working on those hundreds and hundreds of iterations that go into actually building out prototypes, when you're working out the details of your transitions and animations, or modifying those advanced prototyping features that John has introduced, you're really wasting a lot of mouse movements. It just adds up. Next, we worked on something called in-context editing, where now panels appear on the canvas on top of the very interaction connectors that visualize them instead of flying out from the sidebar. You see, prototyping is moving closer to the space where design happens, letting things unfold a lot quicker. So it's a seemingly granular but obvious change, just like where I choose to sit. But it's in caring about the speed and these small actions that happen hundreds of hundreds of times in your workflow that things begin to make a difference, that we actually get closer to the iteration that we want you to get at. And this change didn't come without a few challenges, as in-context editing places interaction models on the canvas, now living with where design happens instead of a fixed static position on the side. We had to work out a few quirks with zooming and panning, as underlying the in-context editing work are the challenges of moving prototyping closer to design physically to get prototyping closer to design in the process. So now, a bit on context switching with the use of another space. OK, in this one, 
Imagine I'm in a place set up with light switches positioned in different rooms than the ones they control. So like, whenever I want to turn the lights off or on, I have to walk over, open the door, and then peer in to see a change. This is also how prototypes used to live, where whenever you wanted to preview your prototype, you had to hit present and switch to a new tab every single time. You had to do this to see anything related to prototyping, interactions, animations, scrolls, even videos. And you had to fight with load times, the constant context switching, the physical tab switching. And this meant that prototypes felt disconnected from your working environment, you know, the place where the setup and design actually happens. So this feels especially bad for that type of fiddly iteration we want to support. It's not even an on-off light switch situation. It's more like tinkering with a very fine dimmer and being really light sensitive. Because ideally, your light switches are located in the same room, which is how the real world is in practice. I hope your hotel rooms are set up that way. And perhaps designing and prototyping shouldn't always be confined to separate rooms, that there needs to be context, too, where they work together in one space so you can work faster and see things unfold easier. So we built a feature called Inline Preview that lets you preview your designs and prototypes live, right next to your workspace, inline on the canvas. We wanted it to feel discoverable, contextual, and configurable. So to start, you can access Inline Preview in the same place where Percent lives. The dropdown changes the active prototype view on your top toolbar, so you can switch to Preview when you're working or back to Percent when you're ready to share things out. And you can use the Shift Space shortcut to toggle the preview anytime. Also, we didn't just put that new tab in a modal. Inline preview functions a bit differently. It works with the Canvas context informed by your working environment. So it made sense for us to make some functional differences based on this context. For instance, the inline preview opens to whatever top level frame you have selected on the Canvas. This is helpful when you're testing out more intermediate parts of your prototypes, since you're not confined to any flow starting points, or when you're contextualizing yourself in someone else's file. Inline preview also operates with a one-way binding, where you can test out interactions in the inline preview modal, navigate to other hotspots, and what you preview here is disdain from the action on your canvas. When you restart, we go back to your canvas selection. And of course, you can resize and reposition the modal as you'd like. These settings are remembered whenever you toggle the modal. When you're working on a page with a device frame set, we respect that set device's aspect ratio. And without a device frame set on the page, you can jump around and preview frames of different sizes or do things like test out scrolls when designing websites right next to the frame. So being able to simulate overflow scrolling is a good example of an area where it was pretty obvious for us to just intertwine prototyping and designing. And in that iteration context, it was wrong to ever think of these two as completely separate rooms all the time. And that's not it. We're exploring even more. So you see, on our workspace, we have this linear process described right on the sidebar. You design, then you prototype, which is not what we want. Our workflows are a lot more fluid than what these tabs suggest. Sometimes we might even find ourselves stuck in the wrong tab, especially when some of our tools are locked to a particular modality. Much of prototyping is closer to design than how it's presented today. So as with the usability work I just showed you, we're continuously moving into this new world where designing and prototyping work tighter, together, where you're constantly iterating, not just fighting your workspace. So I'm giving you a sneak peek, a very sneak peek. <laughs> We're experimenting with merging the design and prototype tabs to make these integrated workflows even faster. It's really tricky work, right? We want to improve how you iterate, but there's so much nuance that has to go into it. We recognize that it's a reconstruction of the tools you've grown with, and thusly, your process. So while we have a lot of conviction in this more embedded world, we are figuring out how to carefully execute in a way that doesn't intrude on your familiar workflows. So we can't promise anything here, but it really shows the lengths that we're willing to go to build the best prototyping tool. So we've had a lovely group of beta testers at NBC who have been playing with these features for the past few months, and we wanted to share out what they have to say. After that, Nika is going to come back in and tell you a bit about the future. 
So if I go back to four years ago, in order to simulate an environment where somebody's watching a TV and replicate all the different variations of remotes, we essentially had to build things in code. It took a lot of time. With the conditionals and all these new features, we condense all those frames into one or two, and we can continuously iterate on these prototypes. We can talk about something in a morning meeting, and a couple hours later, I'm immediately able to see it come to life. This window of time for learning is significantly shorter. It's definitely helped bridge the gap between design and development because we can mock up what we believe the interaction should be. We kind of use that to land on the same page. When you build something and an interaction is triggered in your own hands, it's kind of revolutionary. Hello. At this point, I want to say thank you to all our beta testers who've tried this out in the past, who've like, really like, saw the, the ugly truth of what this looks like six months ago. And uh, to all our like, user research participants from like, one and a half years ago that really kind of like, shaped this feature to where it is today. And I want to take a look at our future. And as, you, as you've seen, I hope you, you can understand or you can like, feel how hard we thought about what we want Figma as your workspace to feel like, what we want you to enable you to do. And so, um, and of course, we want you to enable to perfect an idea, to really finesse it, to really kind of like get in there and get into the details. But more importantly, we want you and your team especially to be able to iterate on as many ideas as possible. Because yeah, as we said a couple of times, iteration leads to quality. And we do believe that there's this chance that we, as a community of designers, will work differently. And that prototyping won't just be this last step, but that exploring interactive and visual ideas is intertwined and intermingled. And you can really like, freely explore the creative dimension that is most important to your problem at any given time. And with our new features, and I still I just love seeing this, um, with our new features, we really believe that as your canvas changes from this to this, that not only will you be faster in creating your first idea, but that it's easier for you to iterate again and again until others join, and they might riff on ideas themselves over and over until you find your best idea together. And at this point, I want to talk, say thank you to the entire team. For nearly one and a half years, we've worked on this release, and it's kind of astonishing, everyone who knows who's worked in software, that like, we've managed to ship seven features that correlate with each other on the same day. So if you see these people, give them a high five, say thank you. If you have any ideas to them, yes, yes, give them a shout out. <laughs> and this includes not just, of course, engineers, but also the help center. There's so many new help center documentation. There's so many YouTube tutorials. Um, uh, so yeah, go, go watch and, and, and consume that content. And I want to recap. From today on, you'll be able to build more powerful prototypes with significantly fewer frames. And this is incredibly exciting as it speeds up your process, helps you and your team to iterate. But Figma is closer, is getting inching closer to becoming this ideal workspace in which fiddling on ideas becomes incredibly easy and fast. And so the question, of course, you might have is like, what's next? Are we done? Can we pack our bags and go, just go home? And of course, I can't tell you exactly what we're planning, but bear with me. I'm going to bring exactly the same slide back. Because those are not projects. Those are long-term goals for us. We are just at the beginning. And we will continue, of course, to improve the fidelity of prototypes you can create in Figma. Um, and if I show you our backlog, you know these things that are on there already, because most of them come from people like you. You've sent us uh, tweets. You've sent us messages. Uh, you've contacted us in every possible way of like, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. And we're getting to those things. Um, and yeah, come to us, talk to us afterwards, uh, and keep sending us those messages. We'd love to hear it. But we will do that in an environment that allows you and your team to collaboratively iterate like never before. That's our goal. And while we believe this, this might change our design process, I want to, to leave with a thought. Because what we ship today, that we integrated logical, essentially programming capabilities, right, in the context 
of an endless canvas-based design tool is new. And of course, we hope it changes our processes as designers. But I want us all to leave thinking a little bit bigger. Let's think, what if? Because what happens if we create an environment where exploring interactive ideas is not just wildly powerful, but incredibly approachable and fundamentally collaborative? What impact could this have on how we, how we as teams and companies design and build software over time? And maybe could even kids in school who like iterate on an interactive idea, like a little mini game, like the Chrome dinosaur jumping game, for example, just play with this and learn programming playfully on the way? Could this happen? And so there is a bright and collaborative future ahead with an amazing abundance of great interactive experiences for us all. So yeah, leave thinking, what if? Where could this go? And with that, thank you so much and a happy config from us all. Thank you.